What's going on, everybody? Welcome on into the Matt Lombardo Show presented by Heavy Sports. I am Heavy Sports Senior NFL Insider Matt Lombardo. Great to have you here. Man, what a couple of great games we had over the weekend. A couple of clunkers, but a couple of really great games in the divisional round that set the stage for the four best teams. The San Francisco 49ers and Philadelphia Eagles, the Cincinnati Bengals and the Kansas City Chiefs all vying for two spots in the Super Bowl. The four best teams that dominated the NFL season still alive and two victories shy of hoisting the Lombardi Trophy and coming home as the NFL champions. It, it, there's something really fitting about championship weekend featuring the four best teams and three of the four best quarterbacks of the entire season. Of course, we're talking about Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow, and Jalen Hurts, who have really been the three best quarterbacks the entire way, dominating the MVP conversation for various stretches throughout the course of the season, all leading their teams to the doorstep of the Super Bowl. We're going to get into all of it. We're going to preview these games with former Philadelphia Eagles cornerback Nolan Carroll, who also was a teammate of D'Amico Ryans in Philadelphia. So we'll get into what he believes is the best fit for D'Amico Ryans on the head coaching front, what has made D'Amico one of the more sought-after coaching candidates this hiring cycle, and a whole lot more. Really looking forward to that conversation. We'll break down some giant question marks facing the New York Giants after a crash landing in Philadelphia in Lincoln Financial Field on Saturday night. Also talk about how the AFC title game is really a showcase of the two best quarterbacks in the entire league. All that and a whole lot more. But as always, if you enjoy the podcast, please go ahead and subscribe in the Apple Podcast Store, Spotify, SoundCloud, toss us a like on YouTube. And if you're a fan, if you've been listening all this time, please go ahead and leave us a five-star review in the Apple Podcast Store. Let us know what you like, maybe what you don't like, a guest or two that you'd like to hear from, and we'll go try to get them on. But those five-star reviews, they really do help grow the show. And who better to preview the NFC Championship game, the AFC Championship game, and break down what makes D'Amico Ryan such a hot coaching candidate than someone who's played alongside Ryan's during his career? And obviously, with Championship Sunday taking center stage and D'Amico Ryan's possibly putting forth his final audition for a head coaching job, taking his San Francisco 49ers into Philadelphia against the Eagles with a trip to the Super Bowl on the line, who better to break it all down than someone who was teammates with D'Amico Ryan's in Philadelphia for the Eagles? We're talking about former Eagles cornerback Nolan Carroll joins us. Nolan, how are you doing, man? I'm doing well. I can't complain, man. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Great to catch up with you. And, you know, I remember, you know, one of my early years on the beat back in 2014, Chip Kelly's second season, you were one of the centerpieces of that secondary. So it's great to catch up with you here. Definitely. Yeah, man. I, I remember just coming in and wanting to start for the for uh, for the Eagles on defense uh, as a corner. But obviously they had Bradley and they had uh, Kerry Williams. And then I got hurt during camp. So it didn't work out that way. But I ended up finding my niche uh, in a different role, which was you know, very unique. And, and like you said, with D'Amico, he was, he was the main reason why uh, I think I excelled that first year I got into Philly. Yeah. And you know, you were teammates with him. Your lockers were nearby. If I remember, mm -hmm. what was it about him as a leader that made you confident and a believer that he was going to be a solid head coach and really has developed into one of the brightest defensive coordinators in the league right now? Yeah, definitely. Um, a lot of times guys that play football and play at a high level like D'Amico has, you know, from going from Alabama and then coming to, to Philly throughout his career, he was a guy that, I mean, they looked at him as a staple, as the leader, and it was no surprise. I, I know when there, when I, there was no room really in the, the cornerback room for me to play on the field, they decided to create and carve out this dime linebacker a position that you see now that's just evolved to these these skilled linebackers and I had no idea what I was doing and I just remember D'Amico just being in those meeting rooms because I got moved into the linebacker meeting room and all of a sudden I, I don't know the terminology I don't know anything none of the techniques not, not anything to look at and D'Amico's just like it, it's it's easy man just listen to me I got you and he really coached me in 2014 for the majority of that season it was unfortunate that he got hurt uh, against Houston, but I relied on him heavily because I, I couldn't tell if a guard was going to pull or not, just looking at him straight ahead. And for him to to just really almost take me under his wing, so, so to speak, as like a, a rookie in that position, it's just to me, it, it's no surprise that he's doing what he's doing because I, I think he's just, 
his demeanor is very calm. It's it's relaxed, but at the same time, it's intense. I like to call it controlled aggression because he's just a, a guy you see in the hallway. He's smiling, he's laughing, and then get on the field and, and he turns into a beast. But he's he's a great leader, and it, it's just no surprise that you see those guys on defense playing as well as they have. What's so impressive about that scheme? Because you watch them and they're throwing stunts at the offensive linemen all the time. They're running all kinds of game with Eric Armstead and Nick Bosa. But on the back end, they're really dominant too. When you look at them schematically, obviously there's a lot of star power there. But what's D'Amico doing really well as a a game designer and a play caller right now? I think D'Amico's just taking what we did in Philly in 2014 and 15. Well, 13, 14, and 15, and he's just perfected it with the players he's got. If you look at it. Nick Bosa, Armstead, Fred Warner, uh, Jimmy Ward. The, I, I don't think it's been a while, probably since Seattle, where you've had pro bowl, all pro guys from every level of, of that defense. And they're just the mentality of running to the football, making sure that everybody knows their, their assignments. And it's funny, the last, I think, three San Fran games I've watched have been identical plays from Philly back in 2014 when I played. So wow. I just think he's taken – a lot of those things from that playbook and he's really just perfected it. And and if you look at the stats and it was actually Billy Davis' defense. And if you just look at those stats from 14, we were second in the league in sacks, I believe. And I think also to run, run efficiency. It was something where I remember looking, I was just like, man, it's, that's cool because you don't, you don't really get recognition for it. But I think it's because of all the mug fronts where you see both backers up in the a gaps, it confuses the O line because If they see a guy with speed as opposed to a regular linebacker, they're going to go to the guy with speed because they don't want to take that on. They know they have to quick set. They have to get out early because they don't know where that blitz is coming from. So I think him being able to do that confuses the O line, but also, too, it creates a lot of one-on-ones with Nick Bosa. It creates a lot of one-on-ones with a lot of those other guys that are on the D-line. Even though he got a lot of sacks and he leads the NFL in sacks, those guys on the line, too, they're very productive, and I think it's because of that double a gap or in the b gap guys moving around and and being able to be in the right spot at the right time and the snap of the ball that really confuses quarterbacks and no line and i'm not gonna ask you to make any predictions here as far as where D'Amico lands i think we're both in agreement he's going to get a job yeah. but you look at these openings right the houston texans obviously that would be going home you yeah. look at the denver broncos we're going to talk about this later on the podcast, but the ownership group there, all of the resources with the Walton family, and you have Russell Wilson, but you're in a division with Justin Herbert and Patrick Mahomes. The Colts obviously is an interesting fit, but if you're talking about just a fit for a defensive minded head coach like D'Amico, where's his best landing spot? What do you think is the best fit for him uh, as a head coach? Well, you named it. I think it's Denver. If you look at that defense the last two years, those guys are young and they they are just they're good. It's just the fact of the offense just wasn't clicking. And I think that's one of the things he will have to address. But as far as the defense, you got certain you got they got a couple good young linebackers. You got Simmons in the back end. You have uh, I think it's Brooking. Uh, they're one of the other stud defensive ends. I know they got rid of Chubb, but they're going to draft somebody. They're going to draft guys on the O line. They're going to draft a couple D linemen. But they were the ones that were keeping the Broncos in a lot of games last year. If you think, I, I believe it was eight games where if the offense just scored one touchdown, their their record would be a lot different. And it was really because that defense was keeping those guys in games a lot of the time. So having D'Amico come in with the, the mindset that that defense already has, it wouldn't surprise me if they're playing the same way they that the 49ers are playing right now uh, next year in that division with – those quarterbacks like Mahomes, we'll see what happens with Derek Carr, obviously, Justin Herbert. But I think a lot of teams in that AFC West are going to be in a rude awakening if he does go there. Now, if he goes to Houston, that would be coming home, which would be something that would be nice for him. So we'll just see. It really depends on how much leeway they're going to give him as a head coach. D'Amico's not the guy to – he's not a me, 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 look at me guy. He's more of let's build the team, let's build the culture the right way, and let's let's build it off of that. So I think – Either one of those places is a great fit for him. I, I think if he does it, he's going to do it the right way, and he's going to come in. And people think he's going to be this this hype speech guy, but he's going to be to himself. He's going to be controlled, almost like a Doug Peterson, how he is in Jacksonville. Yeah, and, and Doug has that perfect mentality for Jacksonville. A young team has had success with a young team before. Obviously, the track record of developing a young quarterback, he's in the midst of doing it with Trevor Lawrence. Mm-hmm. And with D'Amico, 
you talk about all the talent on that Broncos defense. You're right. I think that's an outstanding fit. I just want to turn the page a little bit and talk about these championship games because there are some great matchups. And just sticking with San Francisco for a moment, mm-hmm. Nolan, what makes them so stingy? Because, you know, they, they, they don't give up a lot of points. They force a lot of turnovers. They only allow 77 rushing yards per game. You know, we could talk all we want about the scheme. We could talk all we want about the personnel. But when you watch them, I mean, you're a former defensive player. What makes them so tough to beat? I think it comes down to that bend but don't break defense. And and you stress it a lot as a defensive guy. Uh, mainly, they can move the ball down the field all they want. But once they get into that red zone, that fringe area, we got to be the door. It has to be. Only field goals. It shouldn't be touchdowns. And teams aren't – well, some teams will beat you if, if they scored nine points, but that's if your offense isn't doing anything. But I think – they have that mentality. Once they get into 25, we can't let them score a touchdown. It's got to, we, the, the field ends up getting wider, not longer in the red zone. And I think that is where D'Amico has let them know about their mentality is, hey, they can move the ball down the field. They can get a chunk play. So let's just brush it off. Let's just not let them score seven. And I think when you saw that Dallas Cowboys game, uh, when they played this past Sunday, it was just that. Dallas was moving the ball a lot. It's just once they got down in the red zone, it was hard, and I think also them knowing, too, that Maher probably wouldn't score. It's just, let's keep him inside the, the 20 or 30, and let's just see what happens. And it, to me, I think that's just the mentality that those guys have because of D'Amico and just we've heard it before. I've heard it from him before. It's like, hey, guys, we've been but don't break. And I've, there's been more than one time I've heard that from him. So I, it doesn't surprise me, like I said, again, that they have the same mentality as him. Have you ever seen anything like that, like like Maher the other night and going back to the first playoff game? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not, I don't know that I've ever seen other than maybe Ernie Els. I think he had like an 11 on the first yeah. hole with Augusta with like nine putts. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like that. I mean, you're, you're a former player. I know you're not a kicker, but that had to be like nightmare fuel for any athlete to have that sort of meltdown on national TV twice. Exactly. And I think, and I tweeted this during the game, I said that, he put them in a hard position. He put Mike McCarthy in a hard spot because as a coach, you're you're thinking that if you can get to a certain yard marker for your kicker, it should be automatic. And the offense thinks the same thing too. And and I know in the minds of Dak and that whole offense, they were thinking we're probably going to have to go for two. And they probably worked it the entire week. He, we have these two-point plays or we have this fourth down play because we don't have confidence in our kicker to make it. But he ended up bouncing back. He made a couple after that block, which I think saved him because that was going to be another miss too. So I just, I just believe that that really changes the perspective of offense, and also it hurts the defense because if you know that your kicker's not making any any field goals on fourth down, you got to go out and play defense. It's like, well, now we have to stop them. And if they're moving the ball down the field and they're getting three points and you're not scoring any points, it's just so hard to really stay in that game and have the right demeanor. So. It shocked me. I don't know if he was going on with anything personal in his life. I don't know if he psyched himself out, but it just it's unfortunate he had that game, but he was able to bounce back and keep Dallas in that game for the majority of it. And you look at this game on Saturday night, or excuse me, Sunday afternoon in Philadelphia, and you look at the corners. You have James Bradbury and Darius Slay in Philadelphia, Tredavious Ward in in San Francisco. So some really dominant cornerbacks. Mm-hmm. Who's the best corner on the field in this game, in your opinion? Darius Slay, by far, big play Slay is what they call him, man. He's the guy that I believe once he got to Philly, he changed the whole attitude of that secondary. Obviously, uh, once Malcolm left, there was a, a big gap as far as what this needed to look like from from the back end. Obviously, you know Fletcher Cox, you know BG, those guys were always going to get after it. But it was just who was going to be that guy that brings that identity in the back end, and he was the one to do that. And then with additions of, of CJ and then also the addition of Bradbury, you just see them all act the same way, and everybody has confidence in that back end. And it's just – I just believe if, if you throw that ball up, he's one of the guys that he can make a play at any given moment. He feels that he is an offensive player, and he's played like that ever since he was in Detroit. And he's just bringing that same mindset over into Philly. And I'm I'm glad that he's now getting the pub that he truly deserves because obviously Detroit, you're not really getting anything like that as far as accolades. But he's been, he's been a guy that's been consistent as far as Pro Bowls. But now – he really gets to show what he can do going into the playoffs. And every every time these games get a little bit bigger, I think he'll he'll shine in the moment. So I, I believe he's the best one on the field. And I hate to do this to you, but you're Nolan Carroll. You're on the field on Sunday afternoon, and you have A.J. Brown staring across from you. How do you, how do you neutralize A.J. Brown? What do you do? 
honestly, he, AJ, I, I consider a younger Brandon Marshall. And I remember when I was in Miami, I had to cover Brandon a lot. And I got to understand tendencies with guys that are 6'4", 230, that can run. The best thing to do is play mind games with them. Press, bail, quick jam. Don't let them get their hands on you. So as far as corners for, for Sam Fran, I know those guys are a little bit younger. I would just try and have as many tools in your toolbox as you can to try and slow him down. Obviously, you're not going to stop him, but to slow him down and make Jalen hold the ball just a, a second longer, just to allow that defense to get after it. I think having him go through his, his second read, his third read, or his check down could really cause some confusion, really cause some disruption. But it's tough to stop that guy, man. It, it's like a... I equivalent. I make it equivalent to a boxing match. It's like body blows. After a while, when you're pressing, you get tired of pressing the big guy because it requires a lot of strength. And then it's just that one play that they make that's just it, it changes the game because they're just such a big body person. But I feel like for him, you just, you have to have Home Depot if you want all the tools that you need to really <laughs> try and stop him because he's he's just a freak of nature and and to play that position like he's been playing for since he's come into the league has been very impressive. I, I've watched him a lot. And my son, he's a big Eagles fan. He lives in Harrisburg. So he's always telling me what AJ's done and, and how he's dominating and his different releases off the line. So I, I've, I've kept a good eye on him. And, and I love that. You need the Home Depot uh, tool chest to shut down AJ Brown. That's great. You know, put on your defensive coordinator hat for a second. How do you limit Jalen Hurts? Because you look at what he did the other night against the Giants and carves him up for like 154, two touchdowns, rushes for a score, looks fully healthy. He's as good as it gets post-snap at reading defenses now. And if you lose track of him in the red zone, look out, he's going to rush for a touchdown on you. If it's defensive coordinator Nolan Carroll or even if D'Amico Ryans is putting together the game plan, how do you limit Jalen Hurts in this game? I think the best way to limit him is to stop the run. I think you have to be committed to stop the run and, and put your trust in, in your linebackers and your secondary to basically recover. Meaning if, if your secondary can hold up enough to make the pass rush get there, if it's play action or any read option or RPOs, which makes Jalen Hurts really successful is the fact that that running quality that he does have, he can keep the ball if he wants to and, and take off or he can give it to Miles Sanders. Uh, Scott, he can give it to anybody. And, and really, it's just about stopping the run. If you can stop the run, that eliminates play action, drop back, any screen game, because I think that's the biggest thing that helps Philly is just that physical toughness of Kelsey, Lane, those guys, they're, they're the pillars of that O-line that really make it go. And I, I don't think I've ever seen commentators really focus in on Philly in that O-line the way a lot of people have started to, because the run scheme is just amazing what they've done. And, and Stoutland, I, I, I like him a lot, man. That, that was my guy when I was in Philly. And just what he's been able to do from the run scheme, it's not just simple, let me just blow him off the ball. You might have Kelsey pulling. You might have Lane pulling. You, you might have Mylotta pulling. So it's just one of those things where they got to be gap sound. They got to make sure that they set the edges and they got to have everything inside. But more importantly, let's just stop the run if, if I'm a defensive coordinator looking at the Eagles. And I guess the flip side of that is what, what's San Francisco's biggest key to winning this game overall? I think their biggest key is just toughness. Who's the toughest one at the end of, during the game? Because both teams, if you look at it, they're really evenly matched. I know Jalen has been playing great, but Purdy's been playing. He's put the team on his back. If you look at it, not many rookies have been put in this position to really do this. I, I think the last guy I can really recall that was young and, and did that was San Francisco's very own uh, Colin Kaepernick back in 2012 when he yeah. took for, for Alex Smith and took him all the way to the Super Bowl. But it was really heavily relying on that defense. And I just think uh, it, it's one of those where it's just both quarterbacks, we'll see who plays best, but it's just going to be tough. It's, it's just a battle of wills. Both teams can run the ball well. Both teams can pass. It's almost like it's identical offenses playing each other. So it's just interesting to see in the fourth quarter really how how it comes down i i know you said you didn't want to want me to predict the score but i think it's going to be somewhere between 24 21 i got eagles but i just think it's going to be a, a boxing match most of the, most of the uh the game for all four quarters i'm with you and i think it comes down really to who can establish the run and stick with it you you, you mentioned the eagles stable of backs and the other side you have 
Elijah Mitchell and this guy named Christian McCaffrey, who, by the way, is pretty good and pretty versatile. So I'm with you. I think the running game and, you know, which team can stick with the run and be more successful running the football, especially late, mm-hmm. might come up uh, and win this game. But just one quick question on the other side in the AFC game. Obviously, it's Patrick Mahomes against Joe Burrow. They get top billing, right? You look at Lou Anarumo's defense, and I think one of the breakout stars who's been a bit of a revelation for them is Cam Taylor Britt, their rookie corner. He had the big interception against the Bills. What do you like about his game? What stands out about Taylor Britt? I think with Taylor Britt, and and it's funny because Lou Anarumo was my defensive back coach in Miami. He was. Yeah. uh, When when I was playing, I had him for three years, but Brent Grimes was on one side in 2013, and I was on the other side. And normally – with a guy that's the other guy beside the the pro bowler, you're going to get a lot of action. And I think Lou, he does a great job of, of letting you know, Hey, this is what the offense is going to do. This is what they're going to scheme you up on. You got to know your, your deficiencies. You got to know your strengths. You got to play to your strengths and just try and develop your weaknesses. And I think he's been able to do that as the season has progressed, even though he's just not really getting a lot more action. And you see Eli Apple's playing a lot better too. I just think Lou has just been a great teacher for those guys in the back end, just simply because of his pedigree. Uh, you look at it from Purdue to Miami to Cincinnati, he's just always had success because he knows how to teach. And, and I think as a coach, we always talk about coaches and coaches, but coaching is teaching. If you know how to teach a guy and, and have them understand the game of football, then they'll play a lot faster. They won't have to think as much. And I think that's what you're seeing from a young guy like him, because playing corner is not easy in the NFL, especially nowadays. And and for him to play as well as he did, especially when Eli was on, uh, he was on Stefan, and then he had to, to uh, who was it, number 13, I forgot his name, uh, Davis. Uh, McKenzie, yeah, Gabe Davis, yep. Davis, yes. He, for the most part, he he was strapping him for the most part. Eli Apple did his thing, and when they tried to flop Stefan and him on the other side, I think he might have had three catches for 17 yards, and then Eli Apple had two for 11. So I just think it, it really comes down to, how he's instilling that confidence in these young corners to let them come out and just compete. So I, like I said, it's no surprise that these guys are where they are because of how they teach. And obviously, you know, you have your hand in the coaching game at this point. I know you're doing some coaching at the junior college level. If you were starting an NFL franchise and you could pick one of these quarterbacks still alive, who's your guy? One of the quarterbacks still alive. Oh, let me think about that. There's some good quarterbacks. I would go Aaron Rodgers, though. I, I just oh, think. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, in the, in, in oh, this, I'm, I'm, oh. the, the fi- final four. I mean, obviously, oh, okay. I don't know if anybody's oh, taking would, Brock Purdy, but would, I'm going Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow, Jalen Hurts, the okay. big three. And if, you, if you think Purdy has that kind of upside, then, then by all means. But I would go with Joe Burrow just from what you have seen and what I've been hearing. Uh, Boyd said something that that really caught my eye. He said that I I've never been around a guy that's made me this confident ever in the world, and you can just see it. They, he exudes confidence, and I think that whole franchise has been turned around because he just is that guy. You know, Joe Cool is what they call him for a reason because he he just is cool under pressure, even with the the three new O linemen that they have starting. For him to just command that offense and for them to be playing well. All you need to do is just protect him. And then once you do that, let him find Chase, let him find Higgins, let him find Boyd, let him find Andrews, and just let him kind of just play. And and that's what they've been doing. See, I'm with you. And I look at the way he wins. He wins from the pocket. Mm -hmm. You know, he is the second quickest release in the NFL. He has like 19 quick release touchdowns against pressure. I'm with you. I, I think that especially if they get the job done in Kansas City on Sunday, yeah. I think people are going to look at Joe Burrow a lot differently, maybe in the same way that you and I already do. Yeah, I just think and, and I go back to last year um, during that Super Bowl where they had a chance to win it, even with as disastrous as that O-line played, he was still making plays. He was still keeping them in the game. It's just unfortunate, you know, Aaron Donald wanted it more than he did in, in right. that line. But I think if he had a proper O-line that was just blocking for him, I think we'd be talking about Cincinnati trying to repeat this year than them trying to get their their first one under Joe Joe Burrow's belt. No, this has been a lot of fun, uh, but but I hear there's a you, you now have your own rum company. I, I got to hear about the rum. Yeah, I got to get you some. It's it's Yolo Rum, and it's obviously you only live once. And back in 2017, I uh, I first invested in this. I found it on a crowdfunding page. Just 
I put in 200 bucks just to say I own something, you know, I invested in something. And then as I started diving more into the company and I got to meet Phil and got to see the factory in Panama, I really decided to dive in and, and want to take part in, in being a part of this company and growing it. And, you know, at the time, I think we had 36 states that were supplying Yolo rum and, and now we're up to 45. We just added two more states. Nice. Indiana and Missouri. So we're we're on track. We're trying to sell our 60,000, 60,000 case of or pallet, excuse me, of uh, Yolo rum. And it, it's only significant when it comes to sales. But the fact that we went from only doing about 10,000 now to this five, six years later, it just shows how we've we've just progressed as a company. And the, the best is yet to come, I, I think as we continue to grow this and we continue to we just finished expanding our plan in, in panama where we're able to house more liquor and be able to to sell it to to overseas uh here as well as america uh europe all those other places around the world so it's been something that's been fun for me because i've just taken the mentality of football and working hard every day and and studying the market studying people studying my opponent per se and and, and learning how to just execute and that's what we've been doing. Um, even even when Phil started back in 2011, this company hasn't just popped up out of nowhere. We've been around for 11 years now, so it's just fun fun to be on this ride and 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 grow this business and and be a part of a team. That's the biggest thing that I, I cherish from just building this company is everybody is a team. Everybody picks up the slack if somebody's dropping or somebody's having a bad day. Somebody picks someone else up. So. It's been fun. It's been enjoyable, and and we still have plenty more to come. We want to at least get to all fifty states, and and uh, just continue to show people what we are and who we are. It's it's more than liquor. There's a lot of history behind it. There's a lot of intellectual property behind it as well. So once we get begin to tell more people information and more people begin to look at what we're doing, I think they'll be very interested with what Yellow Rum is. Man, that's phenomenal. Congratulations on all the success. I remember, you know, my early days on the beach, just walking over to your locker, turning the recorder off and just, you know, talking ball with you for a few minutes. It was always a lot of fun. We got to make sure we do that again yeah, over some YOLO rum. We got to make that happen. I got to get some. If you send me your address after this, I'll go ahead and I'll ship you some. You and Tom. Love it, brother. I appreciate it. How, how do people find out more? Uh, yeah, you can go uh, yolorum.com is our website. You want to go on there. Obviously, we have Instagram, too. You can go YOLO rum on Instagram. That's our handle. You can go Yolo Rum on Twitter as well. And you'll see just everything there from the history of, of our master distiller to how everything got started to the awards that we've won. We've won 35. Actually, I'm lying. 36 international awards now. And it's just been good. Like you just see the growth and we have the proof to back it up because this is good liquor. And it's not something where we got to pay people to say it is good. It, it, it actually is good. Can't wait to try it. Got to check out YOLO Rum and, of course, check out Nolan Carroll on Twitter at Carroll City. Nolan, this has been a lot of fun. Look forward to talking to you further up the road and certainly sharing that YOLO Rum at some point in the future. Definitely. Sounds great. Really enjoyed catching up with Nolan Carroll, and I've known Nolan for years. He was, you know, one of the first players who I covered way back in the day in 2014 in Chip Kelly's second season. My second season full-time on the beat covering the Eagles in Philadelphia I had done some work you know, a couple of years prior for a couple of different outlets, but no one's always been gracious for this time. And, you know, as I said, it was always fun stopping by his locker and just, you know, talking football and small talking uh, leading into games every week. And I thought his insight there, both on both championship games and on D'Amico Ryan's, what makes him such a leader, such a special head coach. I thought that was really interesting and insightful. Hope you enjoyed the conversation, but I want to turn the page now and look ahead to these two games. Because I think they're going to be fantastic. I think that these matchups couldn't be any better. And I'm really looking forward to what happens on Sunday afternoon in Philadelphia in the NFC Championship game. Because I was in Philly on Saturday night. And it's been a while since I've seen a team just thoroughly and completely dominate an opponent in all phases of the game as the Eagles did against the New York Giants. Because this is an Eagles team that entered the divisional round averaging 28.1 points per game. They scored 28 points by halftime, and Jalen Hurts didn't waste any time silencing any doubt, any doubters, any detractors, or easing any of the concerns about his injured shoulder, because on the second snap of the game, he unfurls a perfect spiral down the field, 39 yards to Devonta Smith, 45 yards through the air, and it was game one from there, because Jalen Hurts started that game 9 of 9 
passing and, and really had one of the more balanced performances of his NFL career. And for the Eagles, looking ahead to Sunday afternoon in the NFC Championship game, that's not going to be the Giants defense on the other side. This is going to be the toughest test Philadelphia has faced all season, in, in my opinion. You can talk about going down to Dallas on Christmas Eve with Gardner Minshew. The game ultimately wound up not mattering because the Eagles took care of business down the stretch. But even going to Dallas against that defense with a backup quarterback in the game, that pales in comparison to what D'Amico Ryans and the 49ers defense are going to throw at this Eagles offense. And that's for an Eagles team that might be the most balanced team that remains in the playoffs. And listen, the Eagles have a lot of talent on both sides of the ball. They're dominant along both defensive and offensive lines, which you need to be at this stage of the season. And they have an MVP caliber quarterback. But San Francisco's defense is a different bear entirely. They're the number one ranked defense in the NFL. They've held a, nine straight opponents to fewer than 21 points. Five of their last seven opponents didn't even score 17 points. And they're loaded with talent at all three levels of that defense with an absolute tactician as a defensive coordinator. You heard Nolan Carroll talk about, you know, the different schemes they use, the different stunts they use up front, the matchups and the mismatches that he dictates to opposing offenses. Well, it's great to do, and it's a lot easier to do when you have a talent like Nick Bosa, who might just be the defensive player of the year, producing 90 pressures. Eric Armstead has 20 pressures in nine games. Tredavious Ward is in that secondary as a total ball hawk. You saw the game that he had in the red zone against Dak Prescott and the Cowboys last week. And with all that talent around him, D'Amico Ryans is a mad scientist. That's what the Eagles are up against in their NFC title game knocking on the doorstep of a Super Bowl. And I honestly think that Sunday's game and the NFC title game is going to come down to which team does a better job of establishing and dominating the running game from Jump Street. Because against the Giants, the Eagles offensive line just mauled up front. They made Kayvon Thibodeau a non-factor. And he was one of the hottest defensive players, one of the hottest edge defenders coming into the postseason. He couldn't even breathe on Jalen Hurts. You look at what the Eagles offensive line did in the running game, Kenneth Gainwell, Miles Sanders, Boston Scott, they combined for 268 yards. They rushed for three touchdowns. And that game was won up front on both sides by the Eagles. They dominated in the trenches on offense and on defense. Hassan Reddick had two sacks in the first half. Fletcher Cox lived in the Giants' backfield. They're going to have to do that again. And when you look at what the 49ers do well offensively, sure, Brock Purdy has been a revelation because he's playing within the scheme. And George Kittle had a breakout performance because they found the soft spot of the zone of the Cowboys defense and exploited it all game long on Sunday night. But what the 49ers do well is they run the ball with Elijah Mitchell and Christian McCaffrey. And McCaffrey is just a beast catching the ball out of the backfield as well. I think if, if there's one area of concern for this Eagles team, it's are they able to stop the run? Are they able to limit Christian McCaffrey? And they have the personnel. You look at Fletcher Cox, you look at Lavelle Joseph, you look at Ndamukong Su, they have the pieces up front to stop the run, but actually doing it just might determine whether or not the Eagles advance to the Super Bowl. And when you look at the 49ers defense, that might be the most menacing front seven the Eagles have faced all season. And over in the AFC title game, it's going to be a great game. If you want to talk about a slugfest in the NFC with two of the top defenses, two of the more physical defenses, this could be a shootout in the AFC Championship game in Arrowhead. And what makes this game special to me, the reason I have it circled on the calendar, and I'm going to make sure that I'm in front of a TV for the whole thing, even though I'll be in Philadelphia for Eagles and Niners, is the AFC Championship game pits the two best quarterbacks in the league against each other. And as much talk as there's been about Patrick Mahomes versus Joe Burrow and the debate over who's the best quarterback in the league today, as much as there's been a debate about the debate and whether we should even be having that debate in that conversation, I think that Burrow versus Mahomes is a conversation that's absolutely worth having, especially when you look at Joe Burrow and what he's done over the last year. Beating the Chiefs three times in one calendar year, he's had three fourth quarter comebacks against Kansas City, and the most recent win over the Chiefs? passed for 286 yards, two touchdowns, and produced a 126.6 passer rating. That's what the Chiefs are up against. And they're up against Joe Burrow, who put that team on his back in the elements. The snow didn't matter in Buffalo. He carved up the Bills. 
Now, obviously, Patrick Mahomes is the MVP this year. I think that, that that's pretty much decided. And you look at the performance he had, it, it's deservingly so. But the gap between Mahomes and Burrow isn't as clear cut and dry as a lot of people make it out to be, at least not in my opinion. Especially when you project out the next several years beginning this Sunday in the AFC title game. Because if Burrow wins, that's now two consecutive trips to the Super Bowl, which would tie Mahomes. And if the Bengals win this Super Bowl, Mahomes and Burrow are on even footing. And I think that Burrow's ability to win from the pocket and the way he wins pre-snap is a lot more sustainable than Mahomes is looking ahead over the next three to five years. Because Joe Burrow is a surgical tactician from the pocket. Only Tom Brady is a quicker release than Burrow's 2.5 seconds. He's the top passer in the NFL when it comes to quick release touchdowns with 19. And he's the top five passer rating and completion percentage against the blitz. So if you can't pressure Joe Burrow without blitzing him, you're going to be in trouble. And I think that the Bills found that out last week, and we kind of saw that coming, right? Where as soon as Von Miller's been out, we saw that defense kind of take a step back in terms of pressuring the quarterback in terms of needing to blitz more. If Chris Jones doesn't get home, if Derek Nandi doesn't get home for the Chiefs, then look out because Joe Burrow is going to slice and dice you all game long. They're throwing to Hayden Hurst and, of course, those wide receivers, Jamal Chase, Jamar Chase and T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd. If you don't get home without sending extra pressure, without blitzing, good luck. It might be lights out pretty early. And again, there's nothing against Patrick Mahomes. I, I think Mahomes is absolutely brilliant. He's in a system that allows him to freelance. Andy Reid gives him that ability. He lets his escapability shine. And obviously the plays that Patrick Mahomes makes, they make the Sports Center top 10 every week for a reason. He's the face of the league and on all the commercials for a reason because the plays just make you stand back and stay wow. And it's nothing to sniff at going to two straight Super Bowls and hoisting Lombardi Trophy. There's a chance he's going to win his second MVP. A good chance he's going to win his second MVP. But is his style of play sustainable to win with that consistency throughout his entire career? I think that's the part that remains to be seen. This has been an MVP season for Patrick Mahomes. But I think the conversation about Joe Burrow and Mahomes is a lot closer to being one versus one A than there being any sort of gap between the two. And I think that we are seeing the next great quarterback rivalry unfolding. We might see another one in the Super Bowl, if the Eagles and Jalen Hurts get there, we might see another rivalry dawning. We'll get into that next week if that winds up being the Super Bowl matchup. But I look at these two, and I think that Patrick Mahomes and the way he wins, his ability, I compare to Aaron Rodgers, and I think Joe Burrow really is the next Tom Brady. He's a tactician. He's clutch. He's confident. He gets rid of the football quickly. He dictates the defenses. And I think that the athletic ability of Patrick Mahomes puts him in a different stratosphere than any other quarterback in the league. They win in two different ways, which is why I think this is going to be one heck of a football game. I think it's ultimately decided by the two quarterbacks. And But don't rule out Lou Anarumo's defense forcing Mahomes into a couple of critical mistakes, just as they did last January in last year's AFC Championship game. I can really see this game playing out really similarly, because I think Joe Burrow and Patrick Mahomes are going to decide it. And it's going to come down to who can eliminate the mistakes? Who can force the other quarterback into a mistake? And that's where it becomes a chess match between Steve Spagnuolo's Chiefs and Lou Anarumo's Cincinnati Bengals. But there's a lot more going on in the NFL than these two championship games. There's a lot more to get into in the league other than who's going to the Super Bowl. And I think that what we saw on Saturday night in Philadelphia, that crash landing, as Brian Dable called it for the New York Giants, they raised two giant question marks about New York's future, especially surrounding the futures of Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley. Because, you know, I'm as big a supporter of Saquon Barkley, and I'm as firm a believer that he's one of the top two or three running backs, maybe the most complete running back in the entire NFL. But against the Eagles, Saquon Barkley was an absolute non-factor, rushing for 61 yards on nine carries. And by the way, if you're Brian Dable and Mike Kapka, Obviously, all the credit in the world for turning around this season, all the credit in the world for getting Daniel Jones to cut down on his mistakes, cut down on his turnovers, and and make the divisional round with a roster that probably on paper is a five or six win team. But how the hell do you give Saquon Barkley nine carries in a playoff game? How does he only log 18 carries against two postseason games? How does that happen? 
But the Eagles took Saquon Barkley completely out of the game. And had it not been for that 39-yard bust-out run in the fourth quarter when it was a little bit too little too late, that stat line would have been even more pedestrian for a guy who might have been the most talented player on the field for either team on Saturday night. And Daniel Jones, supposed to be a franchise quarterback, some already anointing Daniel Jones as a top 12 or better quarterback in the league based on what he was able to do this season, only passing for 135 yards with an interception. Listen, Saturday night, as much as everybody wants to talk about the fantastic coaching job that Brian Dable and Mike Kafka and Wink Martindale did, and there's nothing taking away from what they did in the regular season, what we saw in that game was just how far away the Giants are from competing with the NFL's elite. Because listen, the bad news for New York is that the Eagles aren't going anywhere. As long as Jalen Hurts is the quarterback, as long as they can keep the multitude of those pieces together on defense, they're not going anywhere. And that defense is what you're going to have to go through to get to an NFC championship game, to get to a Super Bowl. You have to play them at least twice every single year. And for all of the talk about Daniel Jones's improvements this season and cutting down interceptions from a career average of 8.5 down to five picks, it's nice. But did the Giants really win this season because of Daniel Jones? Or did they win because they had a really opportunistic defense that made timely plays, had timely turnovers late, and put that offense in a great position to win games down the stretch? And those are the tough conversations that are going to have to happen in East Rutherford over the next couple of weeks and couple of months. Because when you talk about what Joe Shane and Brian Dable are going to have to figure out, it's how do you juxtapose five fourth quarter comebacks against what they saw in a divisional playoff game on Saturday night from Daniel Jones and only throwing 15 touchdowns in 16 games? How do you value Daniel Jones? And meanwhile, there's Saquon Barkley. Because given the track record of running backs who drop off in their second contract, is it really in the Giants' best interest to back up the Brinks truck for him? To make him one of the one or two highest paid running backs in the entire league? Or do you let him test the market? Because when you look at Saquon Barkley's injury history, you have to wonder if Alvin Kamara's contract, a five-year deal worth $15 million per season, isn't the ceiling. Because I could easily see the Giants and Barkley settling somewhere in the area of a four-year deal worth 12 to $15 million per year. And I don't know if the Giants go that much higher than that. Ralph Vacchiano of Fox Sports reported that Saquon Barkley earlier this season turned down $12 million a year. I don't know if the Giants go higher than 12 to $14 million over four years. And I don't know that they can afford to, especially if they have to franchise Daniel Jones. And that's the position they put themselves in when they declined Daniel Jones's fifth-year option. They could have him for a fifth-year option. And instead, they either need to, off of one season, commit to Daniel Jones for the next three to five years at top tier quarterback money, which is what he's going to ask for 20 to $25 million a year or franchise. Him. And that puts you in a really difficult economic spot when it comes to Saquon Barkley and his future, let alone the track record of running backs and injuries and the decline of production on their second deal. So what happens in New York is going to be fascinating. Equally intriguing is what's going on right now with the Denver Broncos and Sean Payton, because you know, if it were me, if I'm looking at this situation, both Sean Payton and the Broncos, they need to stop messing around to commit to each other already. Because here's the deal. We've talked about on this show, I've written about it on heavy.com in multiple columns. I've tweeted about it. The Denver Broncos, for all of the warts, for all of the issues of needing to rebuild Russell Wilson's confidence, rebuild an offense around Russell Wilson and what he is at this advanced stage of his career, for all of those concerns, the Denver Broncos are the best job available right now. They have the best, wealthiest ownership group, and that matters. Look at the issues that the Los Angeles Chargers have had building a winning team around Justin Herbert. Ownership matters. An ownership group with the resources and the commitment to spend those resources building a winner is significant. And with the Walton family, the Broncos have that in place. If you're Sean Payton and you go to Denver, you have a veteran quarterback. And oh, by the way, for all of the issues with Russell Wilson, and we all saw him come back to earth this year, it's clear as day, Father Time has caught up to Russell Wilson. Who better than Sean Payton to try to turn that around than a guy who went 5-0 and with Teddy Bridgewater as a starting quarterback in 2019? You look at the resources 
that the Broncos have in addition to the deep pockets of the Walton family. They have $13 million in cap space in 2023, $61.5 million in 2024. This is a far more palatable situation with a better fan base, with a more gifted roster, especially on defense, than what you're seeing in Carolina, than with an impatient ownership group in Houston or Indianapolis. And for Sean Payton, it it most likely is going to come down to whether Payton wants to take a turnkey defense in Denver and Russell Wilson and go to war in the AFC West against Patrick Mahomes and against Justin Herbert, the Chiefs and the Chargers. Or does he want to go through a complete roster rebuild for the opportunity to coach either C.J. Stroud or Bryce Young with the Houston Texans? That's the choice for me when I'm looking at Sean Payton and how he's probably weighing these jobs. And don't forget, Peyton is 59 years old. So at that stage of your career, do you really want to go into a complete rebuild in Houston around a young upstart rookie quarterback? Or do you want to go to the situation with the most talent on defense, a couple of weapons on offense, and a veteran quarterback who you've shown a track record of winning with a limited quarterback in the past when I try to do it again? And that's why I think the Broncos are the best fit for Sean Payton. I think it's where Sean Payton ultimately winds up. And I think both sides need to get together and figure this out. All right, let's hand out the Lombardo Trophy this week. And this is a pretty easy one. You look at the performances across the board on Divisional Weekend. And I think it's Jalen Hurts. That's right. We're giving the NFL Divisional Round Lombardo Trophy, the MVP of the week, if you will, to Eagles quarterback Jalen Hurts. Passed for 154 yards and two touchdowns. Added 34 rushing yards and another score. And I think that what was most encouraging about that performance, it wasn't just what happened between the lines, but it's everything that Jalen Hurts said after the game and that his teammates seemed to echo. There was a lot of anger in that locker room after the game. There was a lot of talk that the Eagles felt disrespected by the Giants. There was also a lot of talk that Jalen Hurts has emerged as the leader of this franchise. Nick Sirianni went so far to compare his leadership ability to Michael Jordan's. Dallas Goddard told me and a couple other reporters after the game that Jalen Hurts has been that dog since he walked on the field as a rookie in Green Bay. And Hurts himself said after the game that what he loves most about this team is that they aren't just hungry for success, they're starving for it. And they go out every day trying to be the best versions of themselves. And when you look at the talent that this team has, when you look at Hurts' track record of improving week after week throughout the course of this season, that makes them a really dangerous team going into Championship Sunday against the 49ers. But coming out of the divisional round, Jalen Hurts takes home the Lombardo Trophy for this week. And the pick of the week, we are riding a perfect 2-0 NFL playoffs on the pick of the week. And again, if you're riding with me, if you're making the picks, go to FanDuel.com, download the FanDuel Sportsbook app, make your pick, make your selection, and then screenshot your betting slip and tweet it to me at Matt Lombardo NFL. We'll mention you on the podcast and I'll retweet you. But if you had the Jaguars covering the number in Kansas City last week, you're welcome. If you took the Giants going on the road on Super Wild Card Weekend against the Minnesota Vikings, yeah, hope you cashed. I did. We're two and zero, and we're gonna we're feeling so confident about this going into the AFC and NFC Championship games that for the pick of the week, we're picking both games. And I I love the Cincinnati Bengals. I know they're now the favorites at minus one and a half as we record this on Tuesday. I think there were just too many question marks about Patrick Mahomes' high ankle sprain, about how effective he's going to be able to be, how healthy he is in this game against an elite Cincinnati Bengals defense. I think Joe Burrow has heard all of the comments, all of the conversation, all of the debate. And this feels like one of those moments where Tom Brady walks onto the field in a Super Bowl and just lights it up. That's the kind of night I think we see from Joe Burrow. I think he goes for 300, two touchdowns, And I think that it's a comeback win again, four in a row in Arrowhead, going to a second Super Bowl for the Bengals, which I wrote about in August, that people weren't taking the Bengals seriously enough, that it's a gauntlet in the AFC, but you weren't paying enough attention to Joe Burrow and the Bengals. Maybe it's time to pay attention to Cincinnati. I think they win the game. I think they win outright. I think it's at least a field goal win for the Bengals. They're pick number one. And pick number two, it's the Eagles. And I think it comes down to two things. One. The Eagles have the better offensive line, and I think that they'll do enough 
to neutralize some of the pass rush, some of the danger from the pass rush of, of the, the 49ers front seven. And I think Jalen Hurts is good enough that in a one-score game either way, when you're taking over the ball in a tie game where it's 13 to 13 with 55 seconds left in a timeout, and you have to go 65 yards down the field to kick a game-winning field goal at home. I think he's good enough to do that. And I think the Eagles win this game by three points. They get a walk-off field goal. They win the game and go to the Super Bowl. And Jalen Hurts, if he doesn't cement the MVP legacy for this year, builds on it for next year with a, with a fourth-quarter game-winning drive against the 49ers. So give me the Eagles and the Bengals advancing to the Super Bowl. This has been a fun show. I really can't wait to check out the games this weekend, Championship Sunday. Arguably the best day on the sports calendar because you get two games featuring the four best teams with a spot in the Super Bowl on the line. Can't wait. I'll be in Philadelphia for Eagles and Niners. Thanks to Nolan Carroll. Really enjoyed the conversation with Nolan. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at Carroll City. Check out YOLO Rum. Can't wait to check it out. Thanks, as always, to Thomas Darrow. does a tremendous job behind the glass. If you enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe to the Matt Lombardo Show in the Apple Podcast Store. Leave us those five-star reviews. Toss us a like on YouTube. You can follow me on Twitter at Matt Lombardo NFL. You can read me at Heavy each and every week. I'm excited for these games. Can't wait to break them down next week. Preview the Super Bowl. You can follow me on Twitter at Matt Lombardo NFL. I'm Matt Lombardo. Have a great week, everybody. Enjoy Championship Sunday. <laughs>